Alexander, welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate that. Thanks for taking the time. I know you're busy. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Hey, so you are a 21st century philosopher. And uh, I feel after reading two of your books, you wrote a couple of those over the last decades. Um, I actually read Futurica Trilogy and the Digital Libido, and I started with Synthism. I feel they are very, very accessible. It's a philosophy that's relatively easy to read, which is, you know, not easy to find. And I feel like you've seen the future and now you just write about it. So how did that happen? How did you, how did you make yourself so aware of the future? Well, I should first of all honor my co-writer, Jan Söderqvist. He, he's, he's very experienced and uh, extremely learned. Uh, and we're the same age. We met uh, about a year before we started writing together. But I would say the accessibility in our, in our work, and, and I'm glad if they're accessible. We do our utmost to make philosophies as, as accessible as it possibly can be without losing uh, any of the quality. We don't compromise on the quality. And I think Jan is the guy who really does a lot of the work in making the text in, in Swedish and German and English as accessible as possible. But we don't compromise on the quality. And, and these are, for this is philosophy. I, I mean, the philosopher is the guy who tries to observe the world at the furthest possible distance. But if somebody's even further behind the philosopher trying to see the bigger picture, that's the philosopher. So the philosopher is always the guy who tries to look at the world with the biggest possible picture. And of course, then also the biggest time scale. And that's what we try to do as a philosopher. And of course, we are humans ourselves and we write to humans. So we are discussing the human condition constantly, and, uh, but from a very large perspective. Yeah, what I loved about your books is that, you know, you, you go, come from really first principles, from very abstract principles, but you make really concrete predictions. And um, that's something that I admire with Ray Kurzweil. He goes from very abstract predictions and come, or, or uh, thinking frame of thinking, and he goes down to very specific predictions. So it becomes way more accessible. I think this is pretty rare. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, our, our first three books were uh, uh, redistributed or actually um, relaunched as the Futurica trilogy. And the term Futurica actually is a new literary term. It literally means the mixture of philosophy and futurology. And when you think about it, if you're going to do futurology really deeply, you're also going to discuss things that do not yet exist, because obviously there are new things happening constantly in history. And since you have to speculate on that which does not exist yet, you are going philosophical, because you're actually philosophical the same day you use a new term to describe something. So philosophers are, when they're good, they're really good at just nailing something you have a sense of, but suddenly there's a word for it. And because you have that word, you can start discussing it. I'll give you an example. In our first book, The Netocrats, we discovered that there wasn't really a term for using resources in a sustainable way over time. So say you're, you're trying to, you have a certain resource here and you don't want to exploit it because if you exploit the resource, you're basically exhausting it. What, what happens if you actually have in, in, in your mindset, you're, you're set, that you're going to use a resource, but you're gonna refurbish it, and you're gonna replace it again, it's gonna turn back again, so you can use it all over again. For example, you do that in agriculture compared to mining. In mining, you, you take the ore out, you take the metal out, and you throw in a garbage can, uh, garbage can somewhere. Whereas in farming, you actually have to renew it because you have to use the same earth the next year. And there wasn't a word for that. So we started using the word imploitation. That's the opposite of exploitation. And then it became a standard term in sociology and anthropology, and now it's a widely used term. And it's, it's these kind of things you want to do as a philosophy, you want to find these new words where you actually nail something that people have already considered, but there isn't probably a possible term for it yet. And that sort of work is what we do as philosophers called the invention of concepts. Yeah. Well, we, we, we often associate, at least in the current time, making up new words with postmodernists, right? And they are also, that is kind of the prior generation of, of philosophers, right? The last 30, 40, 50 years. And they have been really interested in, in the human collaboration and, and about themes that are inside our, our human existence that are governing us, but they, we don't really know they're there, right? So they've been criticizing them for the longest time and trying to find out what is actually, why are we here? And what, what are those themes of, of human interaction that are governing us, but we don't, None of us really consciously knows about them. Um, from reading your books, I never really found out what's your, your thought on postmodernists. Do you think they were spot on or do you, they, they were right at that time frame or they're just wrong? No, I mean, I mean you, make, you make your priorities and philosophers do too. And 
Uh, yeah, I read Baudrillard and Lyotard. They were great. Um, certainly Derrida did profound work that I found very useful. But uh, a lot of the so-called postmodernists um, were very obsessed with the symbolic. And because we live in a very medialized world today, media is very, very important to us. They would then go through, for example, the history of literature and then describe the world through literature and, and have a critique on that. And they stayed very much in what's called the symbolic order. Now, what I found fascinating, though, when I started working in the 1980s, this was like 20 years before I started writing, because you have to sort of think through your philosophy properly first before you actually write it. And um, you uh, when I was tell how old you are. You don't have to tell us. Nobody I'm six that. years I old. And I, I debuted when I was 39, but I had a career in the music industry before that. So most philosophers should actually have another career first of some kind. And I was an economist yeah. and a music producer. Then I became a philosopher because you have nothing to say when you're young. And the young philosophers who write brilliantly when they're young, they have to regret it their entire life. Even Heidegger and Wittgenstein regretted their, their, their works of their youth their entire life. So it's a good thing to do like a monocont. Just work hard and then wait and then publish everything in a few years. That's what Tom said. My, his career moves were very smart. But anyway, um, so what I did in the 1980s and 1990s when I started exploring the idea maybe I should be a philosopher after all, was that I discovered that the two major revolutions in human society in the 20th century which were cosmology. We suddenly discovered that cosmos was huge, right? And also on the micro level, we discovered, of course, quantum mechanics and quantum physics. And philosophers didn't deal with this. A few of them did, of course, and some of them even inspired the quantum physicists and the cosmologists like Alfred Lord Python. But the vast majority of philosophers were stuck in big academic institutions, mostly in France, Germany, the UK. And they were only about going through the texts and going through the hermeneutics of monks have always done in, in monasteries. Whereas our entire worldview is rapidly changing, both in the cosmic level and the microscopic. And at the same time, the new technology came along that we call the internet today, which is data to, of course, zeros and ones. And not only were the zeros and ones that could be processed at almost you know, enormous speeds and, and make the world more intelligent in itself, but also this was happening globally. And, and, and now we got the satellites everywhere. We got this one thing. Like the world has now become one huge computer. And that's what the internet is. And nobody was writing about this. It's just like, it's just flabbergasted. It's just like, why aren't philosophers spending time in cosmology, quantum physics, and, and digital when these are the big new themes of our times where actually philosophers should contribute? Yeah. So I was, I'm kind of, I don't, I'm not part of the postmodernist agenda at all. I, I found the overcoming of modernism also kind of dated and not too exciting. And I wasn't really interested. I agree with Bruno Latour. He, he wrote a, little, a clever little book with a perfect title called We Were Never Moderns. And, and in a way, human beings have not changed at all. And over the last 10,000 years, we have not changed. If anything, we've become more stupid. But our environment around us has changed. Our environment is becoming increasingly technological, increasingly intelligent. And that's something we have to respond to. That means the human condition is changing. So proper philosophy of the 21st century deals with the timeless aspect of what it means to be human and the rapidly changing aspect of what it means to be human within a highly technological environment. Yeah, that's what I love about your books. You you talk about the netocracy, so the, this emerging change. And it's a bit of a class struggle, a power struggle that comes upon, I think we already see this when we, when you talk about that, is that the intention that goes to only very few accounts in this, in the very active notes in this social network that we all are plugged into. And I, I, I've been criticizing this for a long time, is that, you know, 99.99% of the interaction, of the engagement in social media go to a very, very tiny amount of accounts. Everything else doesn't really exist out there. And those are the ones with the power, right? Those are the ones that are favored in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, the telecom companies all sold us the lie 30 years ago that the internet would be accessible for everybody, which it is to a certain extent, and then we somehow power will be dispersed equally for everybody. And of course, that was not the case. It wouldn't be the case. I mean, we have different types of talents, and some people are just very, very savvy when it comes to media. And it's a lot about being able to network and collaborate. And that's why the old ideas, for example, being an atomic self, and being an individual are dying because that's no longer a functional strategy in the internet world. You have to be incredibly collaborative. And we shouldn't be too impressed with the things we've seen so far because a lot of the things we've seen so far, for example, the influencers who came along in the 2010s, they will evaporate and disappear in no time at all because they're actually using old ideas and old ideology, which is to promote myself at all times. You know, it's very American, always be ready with a sales pitch. 
but they're actually doing an environment that eventually will kill all of them because that's not what the internet is about. You have to sort of figure out how does the internet work and over time, what will pay off and over time, what will not pay off in this kind of environment. And we wrote the Netocrats, the first book 21 years ago, we basically said, we used both Marx and Nietzsche and we started looking at the internet society and sort of the digital age and how this would be different from previous periods of history. And when we did that, we discovered that it's, it's, it's almost like being in Paris in 1789, knowing that the old paradigm are all out in Versailles having a party and none of them can read or write or count. They're just old money. They're not even old money, they're just old titles, old entitlements, right? And they have a party out there and they think the future is gonna be Versailles and so they're all locked up there, 40,000 people. Whereas in Paris, you have hundreds of thousands of people who can read write and count and read tabloids, newspapers every day and start to read encyclopedias, which are like works of everything that ever could be imagined from A to Z, you know, the precursors to Wikipedia today. They have access to all this information, this knowledge. And of course, these people who live in the small apartments of Paris, but like, what the heck? We should take over and run the world. And the world should be run from cities and not from the countryside. It shouldn't be run by nobility. It should be run by a new bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie will then build factories. I mean, the factors, they will manufacture things that the world will love to buy. And this will, this will cause world trade to explode. And of course, all the power should move to us. And this was key in the French Revolution. Of course, it got bloody and messy because people didn't know what they were doing. But when Napoleon came along, 11 years after the French Revolution, and he was not nobility, he was not a royal, he was not from the church, he was a poor peasant guy from Corsica, like the lowest of the low in French society. But he was therefore, he had a perspective of the whole new paradigm. He had everything to gain by playing himself to be the king of the new paradigm, and he was. And of course, Hegel and the other philosophers were incredibly inspired by what Napoleon achieved. And basically said that, yeah, Napoleon conquered Germany and he plundered us and he burned us down, doesn't matter. Napoleon is the shit. If you just look at Napoleon and then start constructing institutions, Napoleonic institutions, the way schools are, universities, hospitals, there are political institutions, parties, corporations, companies, factories, all these institutions we created over the last 20 years are Napoleonic structures because they're built on the idea that all those involved in these structures can read, write, and count. And that unleashed enormous amounts of power and creativity in human society, put Europe at the center of the world map. It even made it possible for the Europeans to conquer and slaughter three other continents, basically, which they did. You cannot deny that they were successful. And that success was down to the fact that what happened in Paris was interesting, whereas what happened in Versailles was dying. And, and ever since Versailles slowly died, and we're gonna see the same thing now, because the internet, just at the printing press before, it's a revolution on such a massive scale, it completely changed how we communicate with one another, how we intelligently try to foster value out of the different systems that we create, that it takes a whole new set of skills to be a netocrat in that case, to be successful in this environment. And we're only seeing the beginning of that right now in the 20th place. We will then see more and more of it, while we see the old institutions of politics and academia and old industry fall apart. So it's gonna get very messy before it gets back. I find this really interesting. We see this power struggle right now playing out, right? So we have a kind of a revolution in the US and then the capital was taken for a moment and then we don't know what actually goes on with our elections. So the, the trust in the institutions and in representative democracy is an all time low. Everybody sees that, but we, a lot of people just uh, uh, push it towards, well, this is part of this, this uh, transitionary process and we, we're gonna go through this digitalization, but in the end, we will come back to things that we've learned, like democracy and some of these core values will never end, core democracy and representative democracy as we developed it. But you, you draw a different outlook, right? It might look quite different from what we've known during the last 100 years or so. Yes, yeah. to begin with, my favorite philosopher is Hegel. <laughs> and he was a German, so here we go. Yeah. Okay, what would Hegel say? Well, Hegel would say, why are you making the assumption that the political zone will be of equal size over time? Politics can either be more or less important in a society. And what we've seen over the last 30 years is that politics has become less and less important while it's become more and more entertaining and had more and more media attention. Now, the fact that something gets media attention, like there's Biden, Trump, Biden, Trump, that's more like television. That's how television is basically a reality show. And I always remind people that 
what actually happened was that Donald Trump took his TV show to the White House for four years. Nancy Pelosi played the evil witch. And finally, it was over four years later. And then a really lukewarm Biden show moved in or something. But if you look at politics in itself and its influence on society as a whole, the power of politics has actually been diminishing over the last 30 or 40 years. And it's doing so quite rapidly now. And that's exactly where nobody who really wants to be powerful moves into politics any longer. So you leave politics to kind of mediocre people who are more interested in the attention of it. They, they see it as a reality TV show. And that's essentially what politics is not what we're becoming. So the question is then, if power is a constant in society, the power is leaving politics, it's not really interesting to spend any more time on trying to resuscitate politics because politics is over. It's more interesting, where is power moving instead? And the term we use for that in our work is sensocracy. So if you think of like digital, like we have satellites now everywhere around the planet and we have, you know, fast Wi-Fi cables everywhere and everything is getting connected with everything else on the planet and it's moving towards zero cost as well. So everywhere on the planet connected with everywhere else and it's almost so cost efficient now it's moving towards zero cost. That, that is the internet. The internet on the book, The Global Empire basically said, here's a planet called Earth Here's a network, and then you put the network on the planet, and we call it the global empire. Please note that the global empire, we use the term, is not a human empire. It's a technological empire. Technology has no reason to have any borders at all. Technology will work itself towards being one huge cloud covering the entire planet because that benefits technology the most. So that's where we'll end up. Now, if you see that worldview, then, okay, so, for example, you might say that, oh, I'm going to go offline today. I'm going to turn off my laptop. I have too many Zoom meetings. I go off with the kids somewhere. I always tell the guys, well, I congratulate you on thinking you're going offline because if you go into a public park, you will actually have sensors everywhere following whatever you do, looking at your eyes and they know who you are, know who your kids are. You can't go offline any longer. Now, if you can't go offline any longer, that in itself is a system. And that system is called sensocracy. Sensors and census. Sensors that measure our senses, that interact with human senses at all times. That's what we call the sensocracy. Now, the people who are interested in this idea, of course, the Chinese. But the Chinese have decided they are going to create their version of the sensocracy, and it's going to be a dictatorship. Run by one guy at the top. Since 2014, Xi Jinping has implemented the Chinese version of sensocracy. So it's about time the rest of us try to figure out an alternative to that, because we obviously don't want a dictatorship. And I'm not going to moralize against the leadership. I'm just going to say they're not very sustainable. They tend to be bloody over time. They tend to be very dysfunctional. They tend to be viruses that leak out of laboratories when you have dictatorship. So nobody wants to tell the dictator because it might get upset. So it takes six months for the virus news to reach his ears. And therefore, these societies are very vulnerable. We know that communist China today is vulnerable. We don't want it. Now, the question is then, what possibly could be a sensocracy that, for example, has installed power sharing as a function of the technology itself from day one. And these are questions that very few people have even started to think about. But once you start to think about things like politics and law and AI and economics and future relations and power, boom, you understand that Socrates is the shit. You need to deal with these things. You need to do it so quickly. Yeah, I'm fully with you. I think this is really the, the future lies, and it's often... Well, there's a couple of things that scare people, and I think that's when they stop thinking about this and kind of kind of get worried. One is that you also, and I think this goes along with all of this, you talk about the demise of the nation state. And what we're going to get in turn is a supranational major world government. And what we think of is that it's going to look somewhat Chinese, like the European Union. It's tons of bureaucrats and there's... You know, it's kind of looked like a COVID regime. Some bureaucrat decides it, and we all have to follow. There's really no wiggle room. It doesn't have to be that way, but a lot of people associate that immediately, I guess. And then I think a lot of people now, what happened is because of this loss in institution, they have gone very much in this anarcho liberal um, thinking frame. So anything that's coming from the government, any regulation is terrible, and we should have Bitcoin, and it should be like a like an algorithm that basically rules us. That's what Bitcoin is, right? It's, it's kind of, there's some people involved, there's some voting rights, but generally you're ruled by even more algorithms. And I think the European Union tried this, especially the Germans, and I don't think it's really successful. So humans want to be ruled by other humans. Ideally, they, they can select kind of the group, but, um, or maybe by, by, them, by their own decision-making only. But I feel like we, we go on one side very far off into, I don't want to be ruled by anyone. I basically live, want to live in my virtual forest. And on the other side, we have this super monocultural, 
strong bureaucratic UN idea. And uh, that's what I feel people are worried about. What, what do you think is a good solution? You just, you just well, uh, let, let's, let's try to find the netocrats that exist already and then look at their current behavior. And I would say the best place to find netocrats today is to go to places like Panama, Dubai, and Singapore. Small countries, right? Tightly controlled. They, they're more like gated communities, perhaps, to be small nation states. And uh, when you talk to people in Singapore, yeah, it's kind of a, it's almost dictatorship, but really not. So you can speak your mind, but actually there's a small elite that controls and runs everything. But the way it works is that people move to Singapore from over the world if they can't afford it. It's terribly expensive. Taxes are low, though. Social services are fantastic. Do you get the best value for money you could possibly have anywhere in the world? As long as you can pay the rent. Singapore is fantastic. Undeniably fantastic. It also has an airport. You can fly anywhere in the world within 24 hours without any problems at all. Dubai is the same thing. That's why these places are located where they are. Now, when, when you talk to people, though, who live in Singapore, are highly successful, they work in tech, they're socially successful, they use the online world to their advantage. So they have all these, all these sort of, they, they sort of fill in the boxes for being netocrats. We wrote about 21 years ago when there weren't any netocrats. We have many netocrats now. So, for example, I can say with an Iranian young woman in Dubai, and she has three kids and nannies and, and a great husband who works hard like her, and they have careers. And then I ask her, but what if the Sheikh of Dubai, which is actually a local dictatorship, what if the Sheikh of Dubai doesn't give you what you want? Well, then I'm just going to pack everything, take my nannies and everything with me, and move to Singapore in 10 hours or somewhere else. And you're going to see more and more of these places like Singapore, Dubai, Panama is one of them. What's interesting with Europe is this also possible in Europe. You've got places like Slovenia and Estonia, small countries that, for example, I've been working with these countries. To work with philosophers and try to figure out what's the benefit of having a small country of only maximum two million people, but everybody knows everybody else. It's just ba basically one major city and airport, and then maybe some, you know, like Slovenia has fantastic skiing in one end and Mediterranean beaches in the other. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? Now, these small countries are the new model, I think, uh, rather than this huge empire like China and America, they're harder and harder to contain, they're more and more problematic, more and more internal conflict. That could even tear them apart eventually. Because when it comes to technology, technology will be imperial. Technology will be global imperial. It doesn't know borders, but we human beings do. We have to have borders. We go criminal in no time at all. As soon as we live tribal size, so if you move to anything larger than tribal, our loyalties disappear in no time at all. And that's how we human beings operate. So these systems have to take that into account and people can be tribal and give them tribe, give them clan, give them family, for God's sake, because otherwise they will not be mentally fit at all. So I'm, I'm all for the reinvention of these sort of forms of social coherent, of social gatherings that work for humans. But I would say when it comes to nation, that took a huge effort. The nation state was actually originally invented by the Hebrews and the Phoenicians through an alphabet they constructed 800 before Christ. Prior to that, the Persians invented the first proper empire that had power sharing installed. So the US constitution's origin are actually in the Persian empire about 500 years before the Hebrews created the first nation state. So we know people have experimented with forms that are larger than tribe. They're called nations, they're called empires in the past, but it's fiendishly hard to make people collaborate in larger social gatherings unless you have technologies and law to reinforce those processes. That's what we should keep in mind. I would say today, I would go and ask these guys to move to places like Singapore and Dubai and talk to them and say, what do you want? Because what they want will be the demands of the new sort of naturocratic super class. Yeah. Yeah, I had Pablo on, uh, my friend Pablo, a couple of episodes ago. He lives in Dubai, and I think he would absolutely agree with you. And at the end, I was jokingly saying, well, you, you, you love Dubai so much, right? So you're running for public office. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? So even on a local level, there is no self-government. It's all, it's a dictatorship completely top down. I was really surprised by this because a lot of dictatorship allow a certain level of local governance. Uh, you can be not the mayor, but you can be your neighborhood director, so to speak, but those don't exist. And I thought, well, this is really odd, right? So it's, as you said earlier, these dictatorships, even if they're benevolent dictatorships, that the risk goes higher and higher every year that they're just gonna come crashing down. They're great if they are going the right way, but they are terrible if they're going the wrong way. And yeah, I'm but they're like corporations. Sure. You think corporations are dictatorships. In a corporation, yeah. you've got owners and the owners install a board. And then before the board, somebody's responsible uh, for running the corporation. So it's run like a dictatorship. If it doesn't suit you, you can leave. 
And, and that is the model that I see a lot of these things are being run because you can run things quite efficiently that way. And of course, Singapore will have its peak and it will have its fall and Dubai will have its peak and it will have its fall because all systems, all human systems always have rises and falls. And, and yeah. the question is then for how long can these sort of city states that would dominate the world now, how long will they last? And I think here's, here's, here's one benefit of being European rather than American at the moment. Europe has a long history of city states. It was called the Middle Ages, right? And actually, the, it was quite a good time in European history. So, for example, Germany has both been a lot of different smaller city-states, and it's tried to be an empire that mimicked the French and the British and tried to create the German empire in the 19th century for a brief while. But actually, I think all these models that are smaller and more decentralized actually work better now because the technologies will take care of all the other things. So all the benefits of scale you had when you built a nation state, and certainly if you built an empire, all these supposed benefits of scale, the European Union sort of built the idea that we could have benefits of scale equal with the United States of America, and therefore the European Union was a good idea. Well, now it turns out there are no benefits of scale left. Actually, the, yeah, the most prosperous yeah. places on the planet are now small city states. And when it comes, for example, to COVID-19 vaccination programs, who was ahead? Israel, who else? United Arab Emirates, who else? Bahrain. Yeah. Your Iceland. Yeah. There you go. Again, you see, when it comes to something like that, quickly get the vaccines out, get people vaccinated and get the economy back to normal. These small city states were far better even than China and America in that department. And that has things to I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think there's a lot of magic there. And I, I, a couple of episodes ago, I talked to Joshua about the nation states and he was very clear and he was like, well, these things were only there to rally the people. They motivated people and they were um, they were better than the empires because nobody could really attach themselves emotionally as much to an empire. So the nation states were better at this. And now um, this is not really the case anymore because we are more and more rallying about what we see on Facebook. But if that's something that happens in Germany and Sweden or in the US, it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, I, 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 would, I, I, would even, I would even add that empire and nation haven't really stood against each other. They're two different alternatives and they actually work very well together. So for example, why Christ was killed, we, we should be honest about this. But the Sadducite sect killed Christ, they're the ones who killed, they were Jewish sect, they were priestly Jewish sect, they killed Christ. It was because Christ clearly, whoever was historical figure, Joshua Nasser, was clearly a rebellious figure who thought the Hebrews should break loose from the Romans. And to them that was ridiculous. The Hebrews were a special nation within the Roman Empire, highly privileged. Under Herodotus, for example, prior to, to Christ's arrival, then, and certainly they were the central things, because actually they were trained to be the first nation ever within the Persian Empire prior to that. Just switch from Persian Empire to Roman Empire. And the way it works is that in an empire, you have a court language. And the court language is how you communicate on the top level of the entire empire. But then you can allow people on a lower level to have their own folk religions, their own folk languages, their own dialects and things. And that's how you run a good empire. That's how the Roman Empire was run for hundreds of years. That's how the Persian Empire was run for thousands of years prior to that. That's how the best Chinese empire can run too. And that actually makes sense. So if you have a sort of court language that unifies the military, the priesthood, and the courts. Then you can have local cultures. And actually, the idea of universal human rights and freedom of speech and freedom of thought all originate in imperial structures. Because it's precisely about having an imperial structure that if you can locally do what you want, but globally we have to be coherent, then you already create a different place where you can allow people to do that. And it's the same thing when it comes to freedom of speech freedom of thought, freedom of religion or whatever, you still have to live within a Germany or a France where actually adhering to the nation's laws, it's the ultimate religion of that system, that's the court's language equivalent, you can then allow for expression of smaller entities within that larger container. So if you look at empire that way, then we understand, okay, that's how we learned, for example, why freedom of thought, freedom of expression are good ideas, long-term good ideas. They make society more sustainable, and also more creative, and therefore they're good idea. So, so, but then nation, nation is essentially, we can all read and write the same language, and it requires a highly educated population until the printing press came along. And here's the beauty of it. What Christianity had taught the Europeans inherited from the Jewish religion was that you could have different layers of community. And, and it said, Christianity said, there's a community called church, and there's another community called state. So pay to the emperor what you do to the emperor, that state structure, and, and then pay to the Lord to be part of the peer. And the beauty of doing that is that the Europeans could think on different levels. And what then happened 
was that when Christianity started falling apart after the printing press arrived, and people could read and write to begin with their own Bibles in their own local language, but they could also read and write in a local language and communicate in that language, we got the nation states of Europe. And so if you, for example, spoke the dialect of Hanover, or rather you wrote the way you spoke in Hanover, you became a German eventually. If you, if you, if you wrote the way you spoke in Oxford, you became an Englishman. And that's how we got the nation states of Europe, they became one for the world. Yeah, a lot of people bring forward that argument. I don't know if this is something you, you would re refer to as, a, as our future. There is, a, there is a supranational but very limited government that's more resembling a dictatorship, that's more strict. And then we have a U.S. state system that's relatively independent. So we have a, a federation of, of global states that are relatively independent. It can be cities or it can be states. It doesn't have to be a certain size of body. Everyone can kind of choose and might look similar to what we have or very different. But we have one super national government that's relatively strict and not as accessible. It's more like what we think of a dictatorship. So we, 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 it has maybe run by a philosopher king. A lot of people think that. Of the yeah, I know, but I'm not, a play, I'm not a Platonist. I think it's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> so, no, rather, I'm, 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 the kind, I'm the kind of guy who hopes that Puerto Rico, despite having a totally ruined economy, Puerto Rico is one of them, it's totally ruined. It's worse than Greece. It's like, it just loans like mad. They, they've been borrowing money for decades to become dependent on America. So Puerto Rico is one of the most tragic colonies ever. But if Puerto Rico doesn't know how to make a decision where they go independent or try to become the 51st state of the United States, I do hope they go for the independent state. Because they go for the independent thing, they have examples like Panama and Costa Rica and other countries in Latin America that have tempted a lot of really wealthy older Americans to move there, take their money with them, live the good life, and have prospering economies because of it. So I think the city state model should actually expand. I'm just waiting for, I thought Brexit was fantastic. And I hope Scotland leaves the UK next. But I think the more we have spin offs that make cultural sense, because the Scottish today feel more Scottish than they feel British. And that's because it's Edinburgh and Glasgow and a few other cities. And there's, there's a sense of community between, this, between these people. There's a long history of Scotland being independent from England in the past. And they basically discovered that, why do we go independent and then we make alliances with others who do not have to be England, it could be Ireland more than anything. We make alliances with others when it suits us. Because making alliances in a sort of crypto digital environment moving into it will be much easier than the past. And you can have a lot of different alliances and how those alliances affect one another can also be controlled by AI. And I, I would say that, no, I do not want any philosopher kings in here at all. Not at all. And I, certainly we don't want a Soviet economy that would be the price to pay for that. I think that the more we have decentralized smaller units and efficient technologies on all of the levels that operate, the better off we are. And when it comes to a shared law for all of humanity, we already have one. It's called the Internet Protocol. What people didn't realize was when the Internet Protocol was installed in the 1980s, which is the formation of which everything else online is built, it actually became a global standard. And law is just standard. If you have the same law in one town or the next town, it's, just, it's the same standard. So you can move from one town to the next. You know what the law is. You can pay according to the law. But that's, that's, that's what we're talking about here. The Internet Protocol is already like a U.S. constitution, but it's really a world constitution, but it's already been installed. And for good or bad, we have to live with it from now on because it's now getting fixed and built into crypto and built into AI, built into everything that would then put and connect with the online world. I think you just go up the price of Ethereum in the last couple of minutes, Alexander. Because that's where, you know, where, where the economic incentive and smart contracts come together with the self-governance. Um, one thing that you really focus on the books, and I think this is awesome, you really focus on the non-zero sum, and I think Adam Smith would love this. It's really, where do, can we create those games that leave both participants in, or how many, whatever, many participants are in that game better off at the end? Everyone wins on average, which is very different than a lot of these zero sum games that we see in modern day politics, where we take some subsidies from there, move it to somewhere else in the population, nobody really wins in this stuff. So I think that's awesome. One thing that I, I found really interesting in your books is that you basically say, well, competition will be less and less interesting. What we really have to focus on is this global collaboration. Collaboration is a non-zero sum game and everyone will be better off. I'm a little, I found this surprising because I feel when, when we, and you say this in another chapter, when we look at enterprises these days, we all see an increasing amount of, it, of, of competition out there. Margins are shrinking everywhere. So it seems to me for, for entrepreneurs, the competition is actually much stronger than before. How should entrepreneurs react to that? 
No, but I love the Silk Road. And okay, and if you travel along the Silk Road and, and you, you you learn the culture, like for thousands of years, people have traded and they ship the goods back and forth from Sion in China all the way to Cairo in Egypt. You know, all the major cities of the Middle Ages were along the, all the world. You know, it was fantastic. The biggest and most successful human construction ever is the Silk Road. But when you walk into the bazaars along the Silk Road, you discover that there's this beautiful mix between collaboration and competition going on because the collaboration actually is the framework itself. So you, you, it's called membranics. So membranics is that you've got to prove that you're worthy of being a trader inside the bazaar. And yeah. that permit can be, you know, it can evaporate and be gone in no time at all if you don't behave according to the rules of that environment. That is collaborative. So the collaborative part is that we allow you in and you represent a certain community when you walk in here and you expect to bring the best possible goods from that community you want to trade. And then you can trade with all the other communities to see what they can offer. And that's how you do the trading. And in the trading, you have the element of competition. So, oh, okay, we got Persian carpets here. We got five different types of Persian carpets. They're slightly different because they come from different parts of Persia. They're all Persian carpets. So if you want a Persian carpet, look at all five, and maybe the price ultimately decides the one you pick. And if you can get the same quality low price, you probably go for the low price. So There's a competitive element in trade that is fantastic, but it's always contained within a collaborative network. And, and once we understand this, then of course, yeah, that's what we have nation state governments and we have standards for trade. And of course, we've had central banks in the past who printed money and the money was used for trade. And while we were trading, we were competitive. Now, this is all up in the air. It's up in the air because the old institutions that try to control these things using military force and therefore had a monopoly on these things called nation states. They're gone. They're no longer relevant with crypto and everything else. We've got to mind these things. But we still have to create these containers of collaboration because we have the trust that comes out of collaboration. You will not really do a good deal at the end of the day anyway. You'll be at the bottom heap of all trading if you don't trust the body you trade with. So that will criminal network. Criminal networks always end up at the bottom and take care of the shit that nobody else wants to do because you don't want to go to jail. That's where the criminal network. But as soon as you legalize the criminal activities, you actually move those networks up to a higher level where they're actually facing more competition, which is why criminal networks often hate being legalized because actually yeah. they're not that good at what they do. Now, when you see these different layers, then you discover the beauty of collaboration and competition. But our message when we say that we should leave competition and go to collaboration in general today is because we're leaving a highly competitive paradigm behind us. The highly competitive paradigm was built on Descartes and Kant, and we called individualism, and then we put it as an ideology inside capitalism and the nation state. It's the old structure we live with until now. It's now falling apart because it's attacked on all fronts by the internet. The internet's killing capital or making it rather secondary. It's killing the nation state structure, also making it secondary, and of course, killing individualism. Why? Because nobody follows somebody who goes online and just does a lot of shit talk about themselves all the time. It's called narcissism, and we're sick of it. But we love to hear stories and getting involved in communities online that welcome us as participants within those communities. And that's what we talk about synthesis and synthesis practices. That we will even have a spirituality and religion that very much emphasize the collaborative aspect of humanity going forward. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm all, I'm all the way with you with that. I just feel there is this amount of, of software businesses that are eating their way through all different industries right now. And what happens is it's generally a winner takes all game. So there is one company that is big enough, has enough VC dollars. And that's the one that takes over the world. And that goes for any, any business you can automate with AI or anything where you have enough data or you have pre-existing algorithms. I feel the competition is so strong that only once a once creates a natural monopoly and then 10 years later it falls apart. These things, these cycles are getting quicker and quicker. But to, from my point of view, I feel like the competition is heating up. And maybe you're saying the same thing. You're, just, you're saying there yeah. is more if we collaborate. No, no. I We've already seen that digital offers a very fast dialectical relationship between centralization and decentralization. So what happens is that when things become too decentralized, for example, Silicon Valley is basically over. Silicon Valley has peaked already. It's falling apart rapidly. People are even leaving San Francisco as we speak. Why? Because they, it, it became an unsustainable environment, incredibly expensive with a low quality of life. So why would you even stay there, right? But also because that model, which was a higher and higher concentration towards big tech about everything you do. But at the end of the day, when Facebook started launching their own Tinder platform, nobody wanted to do Tinder on Facebook. 
<laughs> now, you're going to cruise for women or cruise for men or whatever and have sexual encounters with people. You don't want your grandmother to be in the same way. Well, Mark Zuckerberg couldn't even figure that out, could he? No, he couldn't. That's why Facebook failed on so many people. Because they, they don't understand what it means to be human and how easy it actually is now in the app world to have different functions for different things. I'll give you another example. I do a lot of online work just like you do, and I love it. I used to work with television boring like mad and I left television. It was super difficult. Online is much nicer. But people then ask me, so are you too dependent on YouTube then in that case? Because YouTube is such a massive force, right? And I say, no, not really. But the reason why I'm not dependent on YouTube is I know ready to date 11 year olds only send links to each other. And they don't even remember which platform they check. So if you become independent from platforms, that means you become independent as an agent and you can then start networks with other people and they don't even know either on which platform they're operating, meaning that platform loses its power. So if a platform starts squeezing you by forcing more ads into your communication or trying to more squeeze more money out of you, then you start thinking, why am I still with that platform? Because my friends don't care which platform I use and the conditions of being there are getting worse. It's like being, again, a trader with a bazaar so on Silk Road. It's just like, if this bazaar is getting unfriendly and too expensive for me to be in, then probably the other traders are thinking the same way. Maybe there's another bazaar being built somewhere so I can go there. And that's exactly what's happened on our platform. So I don't believe at all the internet will end up being incredibly centralized. The Chinese are certainly trying that. I don't think it will work. I think it will be very decentralized eventually because we can now, even with our own hard drives, create entire internet functions today. And a lot of smart kids and hackers do where we're totally independent of big tech. And I think it's going to scare the general big tech when they discover that they're sort of forcing their customers into being locked in in some kind of environment is no longer work. Personally, I stopped using Apple products. I hate Apple. I'll be absolutely honest with you because they tried to force me to use their products, everything I did, and then charged me prices that were Louis Vuitton when they're really H&M. And I'm just like, no, Apple, you're not that good. You're not worth that kind of money. I prefer to use cheap stuff instead and be more democratic and talk to people in a more informal, flatter way. And the way to do this is use a lot of different technologies, a lot of different platforms, and then play them out against each other. Yeah, I mean, that's a very hopeful message, Matt. I hope you're right. I just feel we, we all build up our Facebook groups, right? And then Facebook said, oh, we don't show your posts anymore to that group um, because you don't have enough engagement. And uh, there's paid Facebook pages out there with 80 million subscribers that you basically delivered to Facebook more or less directly. They obviously delivered some too. And then you get three likes and you get zero exposure. And you're like, whoops. So there's a lot of investment that we, or mind investment and hopes that we had for these platforms that as you, and you, I think you're absolutely right, that they have disappointed us and we can move on, but obviously it's another investment. So, but I'm hoping- well, it, 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 isn't, it, isn't it interesting that during the Corona year, we spent more time online than ever before and probably spent more time online than we'll do for many years to come. Because we probably will go more physical again next year. But we did, and Facebook lost market share everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> because they don't give us what we expect them to, but they, they're so high minded. They're so high minded about their own brilliance that they think yeah. they're so, you know, ir ir irreplaceable. And this is a typical mistake, it's called Peter Pan syndrome. A typical mistake that tech entrepreneurs make. And I think just because they happen to be successful and we're lucky to run into the right people at the right time, they're somehow irreplaceable once we get that far. Now you also understand why I'm very opposed to Platonist philosopher things because they tend to be Mark Zuckerberg. So, yeah, they, yeah, no, no, we, we don't want them, we don't want them. But, but I, well, uh, one thing you and I have, have discussed is actually this question of attentionalism, which is probably one of the hardest concepts we launch in our books, although probably also the most important. Yeah, you, you have to help me, uh, you know, I, with the isms, I'm, I'm, there's, there's a good amount in the books and I'm always get confused. So yeah. um, help us understand, well, what do you guys mean by that? Okay, so again, back to the bazaars along the Silk Road. Most of the time you trade it. So you barter trade it. So I gave you something, you gave me something back. The problem with that is that I always had to find the guy who had exactly what I wanted. I had to have something that he wanted from me. So if you started trading three or four people together, there was a much greater chance that you would get a non-zero gain that all four traders would gain from it. It was a more sophisticated way to barter. Then you got coins introduced into the system. And suddenly, wow, thousands can be involved. Now, of course, the way we come in with the printing press, starting in Germany in 1450, within 100 years, we started printing money. We printed money and put little, you know, metal things and stuff in them so they couldn't easily be copied, so therefore they could be used as stable coins. This made paper money made 
trade even more efficient and basically kick-started something called capitalism. Now, the problem, though, is that capitalism eventually ended up with incredibly, fiendishly hard competition on the global scale. So we're saying you're looking at the 1960s, um, the Second World War has been over for about 20 years. You, 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 more or less everybody except China yet is still then dragged into the global economy. And with China opening up 10 years later, the entire world is dragged into the global economy. Now, that means paper money is floating everywhere. It's then becoming abstract money, uh, which is digital money. And of course, now we just transfer sums here and there, and we have certification methods and bank IDs and whatever, and it works. But the problem is this. Since the 1960s, marketing and advertising has taken over and become more important. Why? Because it's harder to reach people. And then we think because we send more money, more resources on marketing and advertising, we think it's more successful. We should rather look at it the other way around. If you work for a company and that company has to spend more money on something, it's because it's become weaker at that one thing and it's become harder to be successful at it. So the business trust of marketing and advertising became fiendishly difficult. And when you came to the 1980s, the whole idea that you would sell a product and tell people what the product was and what price it had, like you've done in bazaars or something. That model was gone. You started making up stories instead about products, about lifestyles and how they're connected. So the Coca-Cola bottle was no longer a drink with sugar and stuff in it you purchased for a certain time. But rather, Coca-Cola became a lifestyle, Miami South Beach, you were a fashion model or you were a rock Emotional star or whatever. Purchase. And after yeah. you drank Coca-Cola. So this would you you would associate all these pictures and these sounds with Coca-Cola, right? Now the digital came along and it got even worse, even more difficult. Why? Because now it's a war over your eyeballs. It's a war over your eardrums. It's a war yes. over your attention. And here comes the big problem. When you start studying attention historically, we human beings regard attention as something sacred. It's not profane. When we go to the market and buy and sell things, we can do that from Monday to Saturday. That's usually when we sort of trade stuff and we trade our own bodies and our work. It's called work and we get paid for it. But we do a lot of trade Monday to Saturday. But on Sundays, we're expected to go to church and spend time with our families. Why? These are sacred activities. We don't make money from going to church. We don't make money from being part of a community. We don't make money from raising kids. We do it out of love. It is sacred to us, incredibly deeply human. And this is where the fight is now. And advertisers and marketing people are getting furious about trying to get into the sacred space that human beings have. And that's when we see mental breakdowns now exploding everywhere. We have all these ideas that maybe there's something eerie and weird about the world going on. It's just the internet. All I'm saying is that digital makes it possible for marketing and advertising people to attack your senses straight on. But digital also makes it possible for you to kill them when they do it. That's called spam filters and ad lockers. And I think historically, we think of spam filters and ad lockers are two of the most important, most human democratic instruments ever invented. Because we yes. hate spam these days. We hate sales pictures. We hate people to contact us without us even having permitted them to do so. We're furious with that. But the marketing and advertising people, they're getting more and more cynical. They're like Facebook, who employed thousands of psychologists to make us addicted. That's evil, right? And that's what tech people are doing now. They're evil. They're literally totally non-human evil. They're worse than AI would ever be. Even AI would back off because AI would see this does not lead to any constructive results. Right? And, and I, 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 I began to say, I've got a one-liner. I've used a few times this spring. But I'm saying that we will probably in the future regard the abolition of advertising as even more important to us in human history than the abolition of slavery. Because that's how much we hate advertising, right? That's <clears> that means capitalism thought, is yeah. dead as we knew it. Capitalism is dead. Capitalism can no longer, capitalism is completely dependent on investing money into an operation and forcing yourself onto people like a rapist through marketing <laughs> and advertising. <laughs> Alexander, that's capitalism, interesting. yeah. Interesting. So, so, well, so this is action. This means there's a huge return to sacredness, a huge return to religion. People are becoming aware spirituality has to come back in here because we need to, to recreate the sacred space, the private space around ourselves that isn't profane and isn't public. And that's what we sort of, like Christ did when he walked through the temple, one of the great things he was say, he walked in and threw all the money guys out of the temple and said, it's none of your business being here. It's not that he was anything wrong with trading money. 
It's just that it's not part of religion because religion is sacred. And I I think these are the really about. interesting topics today. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's really what I really want to talk about, Pat, too. I just want to say I'm not as harsh with, with marketing, but what, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, we, we've lost that, and I, that's, a, that's a recurring theme here on the podcast. So I keep asking people, why did we lo lose all this productivity growth that we used to take for granted and we had in the 60s and 70s, and then it somehow stopped? And then, you know, you know Peter Thiel's uh, quipping, we wanted a flying, plane, flying cars, and what we got is actually the 140 tweets characters. Uh, characters in a tweet. So something clearly went wrong. And what I associate, and that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get to, what I associate that with is that we are not daring enough. That's why we have negative interest rates. Or why are we not daring enough? Well, because this motivation that we used to have from God, that we used to have maybe from this individualism, from this card, it's gone. We, we are this, we are this just and hedon, hedonist enjoying being since 1968 that's completely just following the limbic system pressures and everything else is, you know, we don't want to go to the moon. We barely want to go to Mars. We, we don't, these mega projects, these historic projects of where humanity wants to be, they're all gone. I don't see them anymore. And if I see them, they get canned, you know, two years later. And yeah, I but think I think Peter, Peter, Peter Thiel is right about that his boyish dreams will not happen, but he's wrong about that this actually would be interesting today because going to the moon, once we got to the moon in 1967, yeah, that was news for one day. If we would go to Mars, that'd be news for one day. Then we, yeah, there are some humans on Mars, some crazy nuts over there. It's no better than Siberia anyway. We might as well stay in Siberia. I think this is stupid. It's like kind of infantile. Now, I'm an economist myself. I would say that you, you can't measure productivity growth the way you measure GDP growth because actually the way you measure GDP growth, GDP growth when we get a big pandemic is COVID-19. It undeniably is a huge cost of mankind. But because people work harder and work more to save lives because the disease was thrown into the system, you get GDP growth. <laughs> At the end of the day, solving problems is what's interesting. But if the problem doesn't even occur, then you have a lower productivity growth because you actually solve the problem once and for all. So the problem will not return to haunt you. A lot of productivity growth comes from returning to a problem that's never solved. It's called subscription services. Right? That's why medical companies hate vaccines because they actually solve the problem. They prefer to put you on pills for years and years and years. They never solve the problem because that's how they make money. I used to say to men as well, watch out when you argue with a woman because she probably doesn't want to solve the problem. She probably want to milk the problem for years to come. She can do that. She gets away with a lot of fun. Right? But watch out for how systems actually are solving their problems. And when you solve the problem, that leads to negative economic growth because once the problem is gone, it's no longer measured. So I would say what we're missing out and what is deflationary pressure in the economy at the moment are two reasons. One of them is the technology itself solves so many problems that weren't solved before and therefore creates new markets for those things to be exposed to. They don't necessarily result in growth because you've solved the problem that you've added a new activity and actually the new activity is more efficient than the old activity was, which means you get lower growth. So you've got to watch out when you measure these things. So and the other yeah, thing that people yeah. don't understand with inflation or pressure is that inflation pressure, yes, it's a sign that we're not spending enough of the money that we're printing, and that will probably lead to inflation eventually. But the current deflation or pressure is also because money cannot solve the problems we have. You cannot throw more money onto marketing and advertising and think you're going to get through. You'll only be an even bigger, even worse rapist if you do. And that's what corporations usually do when they get more money. They're more like, yeah, well, let's spend it on more marketing, more advertising. And then their competitors do the same. And it's a race against death. It, it, it's towards death. It's like they spend more and more and more on marketing and advertising rather than spending more and more making an even better product and then trust the algorithms, which is what they should do, and think marketing and advertising will do the job for them. Once you make the switch, though, that the payback on marketing and advertising falls towards zero, I think, for example, woke is an example of that at the moment. You already have corporate neutrality as a new term in America. It took about two years to get there. Meaning the people have discovered that woke is only costing you money. It doesn't make any money at all for any corporation. It's, it's, it's a terrible mistake by, by marketing people to, to go political with the corporation. So instead, by going for corporate neutrality, like Coinbase have done and base company have done, the two most attractive technology companies in the world today because of that, if you go towards corporate neutrality and kill woke, you're actually saying, we're going to kill all the marketing and advertising. We're going to throw it out the door. We're going to make the best possible product in the world after which the algorithms will point to us anyway without us spending a single penny. That is the future of technology. 
And that is when you will see a slight inflation or pressure come back in and higher productivity growth in general, because of course, then innovation can really start. That's what people think should be looking at, say, towards the 2030s and 2030s. Yeah. So you're saying that really it is about the core innovation and it's not, you know, most startups these days are about 80% marketing spend and then 10% R&D and then 10% whatever, um, raising funds. So they are basically a big marketing organization. And very few of them actually do any basic research or find that necessary or rewarded in the marketplace. Like VCs don't really want their money to be invested in R&D because it's not really, they can't really see the ROI right away. So no, and Google and, Google and Facebook have, have fooled all these companies to believe that we can now target the ad so it fits perfectly and doesn't irritate people and gets to the person yeah. who really like to see the ad. Okay, that's like, that's like a cynical sociopathic rapist telling you that, oh, you failed to rape this woman yesterday because you were too clumsy. You know what? We're going to help you really rape the right woman. So we're going to look at the map and find exactly the woman who you can undisturbedly rape for as long as you like. That's what they're promising you. It's, it's not any better. Than that. You know, it's, it's capitalism at its worst because it's the end of capitalism. And the yeah. only thing that can overcome this predicament we're stuck with is to go for tentacleism. And gladly, I see the crypto companies are doing precisely that. They learn from the mistakes the big tech made. And they learn that we don't ever want to rape anybody. We don't even want to seduce anybody. We don't ever want to have any sales pitches because that in itself looks as if we rather just got to put our product out there and if it works, it will work. I'll give you a perfect example. Where in Germany are you located at the moment? Oh, I'm in Greece. Um, right you're in Greece, in Greece, even better. Sunny, yeah. yeah, okay, you're in Athens, okay. So you said to parse, parse them. that's how I thought it was Germany. So you're, okay, yeah, it start is, again. It is, it is, but you're, I you're, been you're, Okay, yeah. you're in Athens, right? Athens has Google Maps. Huh? If you look at Google Maps, you've got restaurants. And probably by now, people use Google Maps so much when they go out in Athens, that any restaurant with a, with a grade of lower than 3.5 is probably dead by now. It might even be that any restaurant with lower than 4.0 is dead by now because people like to go to good restaurants, right? And they could get good good rates even if they're only decent, if they're cheap. People can people can say, yeah, it's infotainment value, meaning that I can go to cheap restaurant and get decent food, and I can go to a decently priced restaurant and get good food, and I will give them best grades. And, and then all the other restaurants are gone. Now, if that's the case, if nobody goes to a restaurant any longer in Greece unless they check Google Maps first, that means you can start a restaurant and you invite only five guests and you give them absolutely top experience. Best dining experience they have had, and you give them a nice bill afterwards, and they pay for the bill, and you have five guys who walk out the door and give you five out of five on Google Maps. That means your restaurant is going to have 5.0 the next day. You're going to have a long queue outside your restaurant within a week. You're going to serve people the next summer, every day, packed, because you created that initial first fantastic experience for five people without making a single ad anywhere. That's how you use algorithms if you're clever. And if you figure that out, then you've figured out quite a lot these days and you stop spending on marketing advertising. Get out of that game and probably leave Versailles, go to the streets of Paris, immerse yourself in the new and in doing business and, and being productive in the new environments rather than think that the old environments are ever gonna come back. Because advertising, as far as I'm concerned, is dead and over. Yeah, so you would consider, you, you think advertising is a, is a misdirection that we've been taking, and that's why we see this low productivity growth. We don't really invent anything. It's kind of like tobacco, right? It makes us addictive to something that is that is wrong. And if you if you get rid of it, we go back to the innovation. Then productivity growth comes back. Uh, let's assume we, we measure it correctly. I know this is a big debate, but you know, in the end, there is when we, one thing that's always wonderful to measure. Maybe not so wonderful in in, in the core sense, but you know, it's wars. But in wars, you see who's more productive. As terrible as a war is, but the war is won by the more productive nation most of the time, 90% of the time. And it's never about which weapons you have, it's the ones you develop during the war. And you can afford, let's put it this way. Yeah, you can add ideology that's clever on top of that. For example, when the yeah. Persians invented that, we got to conquer Babylon, we're not going to boil the children in oil, but actually we got to invite them to co-rule the empire with us. I was like 533 before Christ. One of the most dramatic, smartest ideas ever. Because then the Persians have to invest less than an army that actually become more victorious. So ideology can add value to that. What you try to do yes. when you do innovation. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great segue to religion. I want to talk you talk to you about that because it's such a big part of what what you what you what you investigate in in, in, a, in the trilogy. And what you what you really exemplify, and I, I've never read that anywhere else. It's it's really how we look into Abrahamic religions as a, 
as a way that we um, we felt we are bound to the thought process of Abrahamic religions and then Descartes changed that. We the thought about the individual, right? And now we in this in this third process, or maybe it's it's much longer numbers than this. And in this process now we we really we've lost our way and the only way out is to, to become like Nietzsche, right? To find that Übermensch to to define ourselves and define our values in this crazy, more crazy world that looks more like quantum mechanics that we now discover. That seems to be a bit of the thesis, well, I probably misquoted to you 100%, but that's... No, 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 you get it. I, I would say that Nietzsche's cause of the death of God, today we would call it the death of a paradigm. Yeah. It was a certain God that died. It was the Protestant God that died in Europe, and he saw something rise after that because of a new paradigm that people could read and write. The Bible was no longer the only literature people had, and therefore they would have a different world. So I'd say the death of a paradigm is what I'm interested in, and the rise of a new paradigm that hopefully rises quickly enough to take over. Because if you don't have a new paradigm rising and all of an old one dying, you get the apocalypse. That's what you historically get, right? So let's see where we're heading here. I would say you can't even talk about the West as the world. In that I, one of the things I knew when I started working in the 1980s was that I can't really buy this mythology that all started with the Greeks, and the Greeks were somehow European. Because the Greeks saw themselves as like protection against the barbarians to the north of a civilized world where they were very minor and at the margin. They saw the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Indians as well. Okay? That was the world. The Middle East was the world. It, it was the West, the original West. So I don't buy into that. I converted to Zoroastrianism myself. I started Taoism and Buddhism for years. I learned Sanskrit, Novesta, some Mandarin, so I could study Chinese, Indian scriptures, the original versions. And I discovered that awesome. they were actually thousands of years older than the European traditions. And I also think the Greek Hebrew connection was constructed in the 19th century by German and French scholars. But really, it is, it is the Hebrew Persian connection that is the origin of the West. And therefore, we can also include Islam into that, but not only the Abrahamic faith, but also the pre Abrahamic faiths, and pagan cultures, and all the other. Now, yeah. on top of that, we created other religions. You always have military religions and you have priestly religions that aren't the same ones as the folk religions. And the priestly religions in our society is academia. The military religions of, of, the, of our society is the state, the nation state, and tied in between those are the markets. These are religious institutions. They both have certain beliefs that certain things are good for humanity, or at least the good for the institutions themselves and nothing else, and therefore these things will operate in certain ways. And these are built starting in Venice in the 14th century forward. Printing press helped it along with our paper money, and they all exploded, and then we got Western capitalism. But none of this is granted in history that it will stay around forever. And if you, if you fundamentally change the very conditions for that, for example, if you completely prevent capitalism from being able to communicate to people the way it has been doing for the last 100 years, it's probably not even capitalism any longer. Because if you completely destroy the communicative process of capitalism, which we are doing at the moment, then it's no longer meaningful to discuss capitalism. And it's much more meaningful to discuss what if we look at the world from the attentional perspective? Like, what is it that I give my attention to? Where do I uh, project infotainment value to something? Does this inform me or does it entertain me? Hopefully both. That's where I will keep my eyeballs and my eardrums, my focus, and also get fed and, you know, have all my needs taken care of. And, and that's what algorithms, that's how good algorithms are built. They're built exactly in that direction to give us that advantage. And that's why sort of an algorithmic society, as we call it, a society makes more sense. And here comes the important part. That makes it enormously important to train people to think that certain things are sacred, not that things are perfect. Sacred is that you, you will never sell. And private and public, meaning that that which you offer on Instagram and the pictures of your kids and all those things you put out there without plundering your soul completely and emptying it, all content, that's public, right? Uh, what people are now discovering is they need to create much larger private zones or otherwise they freak out. And I'm really interested in these philosophical questions. You know, what does it mean to be private? What does it mean to be sacred in the in this sort of world we're moving into now? And we will for sure know that everybody wants access to our sacred. So everybody wants to go because the only way to get our attention is to have access to our own sacred space. But we don't want the traders to be in there at all. Yeah. One thing that's that's really fascinating. One thing that I immediately always think of, and that might not be something you, you've looked into 
uh, but you looked into everything. That's that's what I'm discovering. You 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 have the answer to all these 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 problems. Very often, I think they're they're very very profound the way you you you, you thought about them. One thing that I always feel comes with religion is this mandate to improve yourself. That you know, it's kind of this error correction to our limbic system. We have this limbic system that drove us forward. It's kind of like our ad, we are an animal. But then the religion comes on top of it, creates more trust, and kind of error corrects certain behaviors that are just too short term because we want to have a long term positive outcome. Sometimes they go along, or often they go along. Sometimes they don't, and that's what we use religion for. And that's kind of we, we, when when we, we are talking about algorithms now. When, um, I think this is also the, 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 the new way we talk about this, this, this religious instinct. It's all over the place. Like everything is possible, right? So we, everything is possible and not possible at the same time. So what I'm, 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 I think what religion gave us is to give us this mandate, okay, this is a way how you should develop because it makes you and the society around you more successful. Now that seems to be harder to find to get to this point because we can't just open up the Bible. We can. I think the utility is still there, but there is a cultural... Um, disincentive to do this and be like, okay, you have to find your own way. And I don't think a lot of people have the ability to do this. I mean, I feel like I can get there one day, but I, by that time, I'm probably dead. So it, I don't get this, this, I get the wisdom maybe when I read the Bible, but I don't get the mandate because I don't behave like the Bible. Wants no, I, mean, I don't think the Bible works any longer. And this is why I think Christianity is overdone well, that I'm very pro-religion. I think we need new religion or we have to go to older religions that are more sustainable and are more suitable for the kind of world we live in now. So I don't look yeah. for religions that preach supernatural phenomena or life after death or anything like that that we don't believe in any longer. But luckily, there are religions that are even older than Christianity that never did that. They didn't take the shortcut. They didn't do the quick fix thing that Christianity did that made Christianity popular. And both Christianity and Islam suffer from their popularity, they suffer from the fact that they did a lot of shortcuts and quick fixes and fancy storytelling that actually is no longer credible. But on the other hand, uh, if you talk to somebody today who declares, proudly declares they're a secular atheist and they're over-religion, overdone with it, you essentially hear a very self-obsessed cynical nihilist talking, aren't you? And why would you trust a cynical nihilist? <laughs> the problem is if you throw religion out the door, you haven't really understood what religion does to you and the way it's supposed to shape you and domesticate you and train you for your next step in your life. So in tribal religion, power is with the elders, right? The old matriarch and the old patriarch, they have an ultimate power. And their job is to train you from being a child into being an adolescent, and then from adolescence, train you into being a proper young adult. And then from a young adult, and just like the older adult, and then become a parent, and then take responsibility for others, and therefore receive the blessing of the community, having purpose and meaning in your life. And when you think of it this way, I, I mean, I've worked with tribes all over the world for years, right? I don't see any of these modern predicaments with mass depression and as lost, lost sense of purpose and meaning. I, yes. I've never Amen. seen that in the Amazon. I just never seen. It. And I'm not romantic about the tribes. Hey, hey, they, they buy T-shirts and, 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 and jeans as soon as they can, and they go online and get Wi-Fi and start playing funny games as soon as they, they do. So I'm, I, I'm not saying we should go back to their life, but I say we should understand what religion is. Now, religion, though, the two different types of religion that we developed over time. The first one is the original religion, which is called nomadology. This is basically the religion of a nomadic tribe that constantly has to be on the move. It has to be on the move. So all change is just to move from one spot to the next to survive. That's all change. Everything else is circular. Everything returns to the same. There are seasons, there are days and nights, and everything returns to the same. This is called the nomadological mindset. Hinduism is a perfect example of a completely nomadological religion. And that's what's been very hard for India to be, for example, an explorative industrial superpower on a par with American Europe. They're getting around that now by not being Hindus any longer because according to Hinduism, everything should remain the same. You should stay within your caste. You should not leave anything, which is very nomadological. But what happens yeah. about 4,000 years ago, starting in Persia, this is the origin of the West eventually that comes through Persians to Hebrews and on to the Greeks, and that comes to Hellenism that comes to the West eventually, comes the idea that a dramatic change can happen in history that changes things forever, and thereby changes the rules. And of course, this idea occurred for the first time when we permanently settled. So your, your mind is just like, okay, we're not gonna move tomorrow. I don't have to focus my entire mind on the change of territory and move from one place to the next to survive. I can actually, I can actually stay in the same place, I can trade in this place, I can farm, I can tame and domesticate animals, I could stay here. What am I going to do with my boiling head in that case? Ideas, right? 
So we move from genetics to memetics and we move towards exploration. And this is where we get the first innovations in history. The first proper innovations that changes everything forever. And the idea that the son can live in a better world than the father is an idea that Zoroastrians who started preaching first. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the eventological religions, even the sort of scientism we have to do, or the belief that you can go to Mars or go to Moscow, or whatever you like. All of these ideas are eventological faith. And I think that's important. I think what the West can contribute in dialogue with China and Japan and India these is that we got onto the eventological pattern 4,000 years ago. And that was actually a really good idea. Now we need even more eventology today to fix the planet, make it more sustainable and resilient so that future generations can live here. But why would we do that? that that's a that's perfect, perfect example of the next growth sector, the next productivity growth comes within making the container more sustainable. That's why I'm an ecotopian, not an environmentalist. I think technology is the solution to the current problems that environmentalism is addressing. Well, I think the same way, exactly the same way, and I think the same about climate change. Um, when, when you, and I love this in the book, you talked about communism as something I personally experienced, and you said, well, this is basically just a Christian cult. So it's, it kind of takes values out of Christianity, it takes them to an extreme, then makes itself God, which obviously Christianity is, is, has always has this problem with idolatry. There's saints everywhere. It's not as strict as Islam or, or Judaism. But and we, we still have um, these cults being generated. Um, a lot of people think of wokeism as one of the similar cult, Christian cult that comes out of it and goes similar ways as communism. You can argue about that. Um, do you feel there is something right now um, that that is a bit of new religion that will will fulfill that, right? This QAnon, a lot of people think about that. W what do you feel comes closest enough to this new religion that takes a lot of these learnings and maybe gives us this new direction that's maybe positive? You never know before. Actually, people use. Well, I'm interested in I'm interested in imperial religion. I'm interested in religion in the sense that we can have a dialogue with the Chinese and and maybe and create a competitive alternative to what they're dreaming about doing with philosophy. But that's where the imperialism, that's what philosophy really is. So you, you, you put that on the philosophical, like, okay, what is the future of whatever replaces politics, what replaces academia, what replaces mass media? All of these different institutions that will potentially be sustainable over time. Or are they just anarchies or plurarchies that we can't control, right? So you try to figure that out. That's a map you're trying to build. Meanwhile, the vast majority of people will fall straight into what we call the golden age of sects and cults. And we wrote a paper in 2012, said it was not about this. And, and the golden age of sex and cults means that the worse these sex and cults are, the more horrific they are, the weirder they are, the stranger they are, probably the more they will attack. Because unfortunately, <laughs> human beings have yeah. lost it completely. It will only go after even more ambivalence. We're trained to look for dangers everywhere. So what we're looking for phenomenologically, we're observing and taking in the world, is that we're looking for what is the weirdest thing out possibly. And if it's weird, we start to think it's true these things. But the word it's getting subserved to most of us, actually, the weirdest proposal we can find looks like the most credible one, ironically. And this is what we meant, this was nine years ago, and we're seeing it explode. Now, Canada and all these calls, they'll be over no time at all. Occupy Wall Street, but it was over no time, too. I mean, you can't do anything any longer and get people to walk out of the streets spontaneously, demonstrate against something for three days. You know, it's like Occupy Wall Street. They stayed in Wall Street for three days. They didn't even know the Wall Street guys were no longer in Wall Street. They hadn't even done the research. And after three days, the financiers came to Wall Street to meet them and sold them T-shirts and said, I was there. Yeah, Peter Skiff. So they, so they, were, <laughs> brave, they, they, they were including the capitalist system they were supposed to, to demonstrate again because they were too naive to understand what kind of forces they were. And that's what I see a lot of these days. I, I see a lot of these stormings of the capitalism. We will have a lot of that in Europe this summer. I'm sure about that. I think we created an enormous pressure cooker with the COVID-19 lockdown. And hey, people are going weirder and weirder. But we're saying this in the book, It's Libido. We're saying that we've got to see more and more of this weirdness and this strangeness and that people get more and more crazy because we don't have a central order in place that under which we can then create more credible stories. It, it's two layers. It, the imperial layers were monotheism originally was, and the other more popular levels were polytheism. So in Catholic faith, you have God as an abstract concept, and there's three aspects of God, but actually you all go and worship the Virgin Mary or some saints anyway, because you can relate to them. You can't relate to an abstract God. And it's the same thing for people today. People can only relate to other people. That's the vast majority of people can do that. 
the very few people who can relate to the abstract are the ones that will be in control, because they're always the guys who get the power. But for the vast majority of people, they must relate to something much more concrete. And that concrete thing will be different forms of iconologies. There will be celebrity worships and you know saints and martyrs or whatever, and, and George Floyds or whatever you got. They, they, they will go for these things. But these all of these sects and cults might look very powerful and impressive because they, they can so quickly, but they also fall apart quickly because they have no sustainability built in. Yeah, but sooner or later, I think this process has been going on all the time. There is something that, that we produce that makes us, that we, we stick to for, for like a certain amount of time, but it also makes us more productive, right? I think this is what I think of the early Christianity. It was a cult, it was crazy, they all celebrated the safety of Jesus Christ. It made people more productive, they had more babies. And then 200 years later, it took over the big empire in the world, and then it took over the world, right? So it's a big success story that happened with a relative short time frame once enough people associate themselves with it. We don't have that yet, which is probably a good thing, because I read that when you when you spoke about Nietzsche, who you co-author, that we yes, we want to be the Übermensch, but on the way to get there, there's going to be a lot of medium stages where we kind of follow a false idol instead of improving really ourselves. And this is these, these medium stage religions, right? They only... Like communism only lived for like a hundred years or two hundred years. Well, well that's I, 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 I defend the word communism. I always say that I'm a communist, but I'm not a socialist so, because I think that actually, even <laughs> yeah. Marx made the same mistake that he, he would have accused Lenin of. He was simply hurrying too much. Communism is basically just tribal life, and the trust of the tribe right. and split and shared resources within the tribe. So that, that's that's what communism is. It's longing back to tribal life. Tribal life is possible. Well, I'm saying this tribal life is probably so, regulated yeah. with the help of technology, and you can have you can have small you can have larger groups than just tribes within sort of communist utopias. But communism can only be one voluntary, and it can only be practiced by an elite, which is yeah. the exact opposite of what the left promised people. So I would say if you go from capitalism to socialism, you can go from socialism to communism. But then you have to remember that Marx was heroic, just like Nietzsche. He just he went he he, he thought his heroic course would be a group of people, a proletariat would then be that. We would then say the netocrats that they take that role. But uh, that's, that's, that's all I say with Marx, and then I'll leave it at that. What I'm saying is that woke, for example, is not Marxist at all. Woke is completely Rousseauian. This is Rousseau. This is, this is I'm, I'm born a tabula rasa, and I can pretend that I'm anything, gender, whatever, like a skin color, yes. and if you don't like that, then fuck you, then I'm going to kill you, hold you responsible forever, and milk you for all your resources, because I'm going to do victimhood calls from now, right? And that's, of course, why a lot of black Americans hate Black Lives Matter, because they don't want to go into this woke mode or victim mode and say, yeah, we have a terrible past to look back at, but actually, we have done, done that. We've dealt with that. We can all be successful. So why don't we look ahead instead of staying within that sort of realm of constantly returning to our own failure as if we enjoyed it, right? But I think so it's Rousseau that's people, problematic here. Yeah, because people have a, have a certain bad conscience. I think it trades on other people in society having a bad conscience because otherwise you just ignore that claim, right? But the, the, the claims of wokeism is being taken very seriously by a big majority of people. And this, the, the first reaction is, oh, you, you tell me you're a victim? Okay, let me investigate. Can I give you the benefit of doubt? So it's kind of trading on this Christian attitude, I feel, that, that we still have. Maybe that's yeah. just the same else, but I feel that's where yes. it came from. Yeah. yeah. And it's incredibly problematic. And it's not going to win in the long run anywhere. I mean, if, in a way, the world is becoming like India. So say India with a Singapore next door for the elite. That's probably more what the world will look like in 50 years' time. And... And learning from like India that? and understanding. What, what do you mean by, yeah, uh, it's going to look well, the, the, the complexity that we have to deal with, and hopefully they're not going to war one another too much, creates a society that's very similar to India. Now, for good or bad, I, I like India a lot, right? It's been a lot of poverty, but they've also done very well in the last 30 years. Um, so the only problem with India is to, to maintain peace over time and not to create too much rivalry in very densely populated urban communities, they went for the caste system. So instead of saying that uh, your father did this, you might want to do something very different. And your archetype might be different from your father. In this sense that your father did this, you must therefore do the same thing. You must do it the way he did it and not do it any way differently than he did. Yeah. That creates zero incentive for non-zero some gains, right? Yeah. That, that's just that's just splitting the same cake all the time and probably larger population, smaller cake makes it even worse and you get even poorer. And that's the problem you get with the caste system. So the caste system, what I want to avoid, but other than that, 
to live in a society with so much complexity on so many different levels to still make that work and having a sort of a, a religion that's implemented in different ways in different institutions on different levels too, that the Indians have managed to do, I think actually it's a model that must be studied. And for no other reason, India is the only country we know in the world that cannot be run the way communist China is run today. But India is for sure immunized against the kind of system communist China is trying to implement. And that but they call themselves communists kind of in, in, in many Indian states. You know, they, they, they yeah, yeah, like yeah, they do. But they have democratic system. communist parties you vote for and you can vote them out of power. They, the, only, the only place in the world that acts in democratic communism means successfully practice. Yeah. And, and East Bengal and, and, and uh, several other states in India you know, have done quite well on the communist rule, but this is a communist democratic rule, right? So it's not, it's not Maoist communism, not Chinese communism. It's not communism per big per decree. They're actually... Through the, through the voice of the people from beneath. And of course, it's all depending on which ones of the castes you get to vote for you in the elections. That's the Indian system. Yeah. But, but I think so, in general, so India, India, India's becoming digitalized in a very fast way at the moment. And, and there's a lot of interesting things happening. I work a lot in India, especially before the corona was there all the time. And I find it very fascinating because I've, I've argued for over 20 years that the world would increasingly look like India. Uh, so learn from what India did well and did less well, because that's probably that's so the best interesting. Lesson. I lived in India for a while, and I, I was really shaken by that. It, it, it's a sense of I care about myself and not not about anything else. Like you see this basically in sidewalks, so you see it about cities. It's it's really parcelled up in certain individual behaviors, and it's very different some concept than when you think of Europe, right, where everything is top down. Maybe that's the idea in India, but it never really worked that way, or it's really parcelled out in my individual success, and. There's a caste system. I never could wrap my mind around the caste system. Why this still a, still exists and hasn't been competed away? I couldn't wrap my mind around this. So something happened or didn't happen in India that never. But you got you got the top down within the castes. That's a trick. So yeah, yeah, yeah. for example, I'm a, I'm a Zoroastrian, and there's a small Zoroastrian minority in India are very successful in India called the Parsis. Uh, they're probably the most successful ethnicity in the world when you look at education levels and etc. They even beat the Israelis. So there you go. Uh, but the Persians, I live with the Persians, and they actually live as if they were a caste in the Hindu system. Exactly why they're so tolerated. But because they got such a strong sense of top-down structure within their own community, they in practice live like an elite caste within Hindu society. So, for example, socially acceptable for a Parsi to marry a Brahmin. If you marry a Brahmin, you marry somebody at the top of the Hindu caste system. And the Brahmins love the Parsi friends around and love to marry the Parsi family. Even Indira Gandhi, for example, married a Parsi. So, but technically speaking, her sons, right, you've got to, for example, was a Zoroastrian and not a Hindu. So when you learn these things, when you live in India, you discover, okay, so it's within these structures that it works, where society as a whole operates as a kind of massive, huge, bottom-up thing that occasionally can, you know, pop, something can pop out of it that can work for a while. It can be, say, a local little empire or some kind of nationality can pop up for a while, but then it probably falls down back into, again, to the community, where really all you do all the time with your narrative storytelling is to connect the community in such a way that you don't go to war with one another more than you absolutely have. And that is fundamental to religion. And that's why you have the yogis everywhere. Where do the yogis live? In between tribes, in between castes. They're not a category you can fit into anywhere else because they just go betweens. And if yogis are horizontal go betweens in a side like India, then you can figure out that's how shamans worked in tribal communities too because they're similar. And that means they can also then take care of the vertical communication, which is talking to the gods in your behalf. Yeah. And that's exactly where religion starts with the yogis. It, it starts with the yogis' relationship between tribes. What's in between worlds, androgynous yeah. in between men and women. The shamanic, shamanoid in between tribes, and the horizontal communication of, with foreign forces, with forces outside of your control. These study, they can also communicate vertically, that's to the underworld, to the upper world. Because they can do so, you go to them with your concerns in your life. And they're neutral, they're not involved in the sort of rivalries and power games that the rest of us are constantly. That's so fascinating. I mean, the way you you <laughs> take apart that part of Indian religion, that's, that's incredible. I've, I've never heard something like that, so intense. I wanted to ask you two more questions. First one is, when you look at the last 20, 30 years, you've been saying you, you really focus on philosophy the last 20 years, what surprised you the most? What, what turned out different than what you initially predicted? Oh, it's usually to do with the speed of change. So. 
uh, technology can change slower than you expected because there are more hurdles than you thought there would be. And there's suddenly motivated or unmotivated, but very definite resistance to innovation. Um, then something like COVID-19 comes along and in some departments slow things down, but the vast majority of technological development was actually hurried up this year. That's exactly why the stock exchanges are doing so well, because the tech yeah. companies have gone through the roof. Why? Because we discovered that a lot of things we did before, the physical bodies has spent tons of time on, can actually be done through tech. And we can save time, save energy, and do other things with our minds. So that is, it's not necessarily productivity growth, but it's a growth in the terms of quality of time that we have to spend on other things. So yeah. that's that's that that just speeds up things. And then I can say Digital Libido was released in 2018, working on process and event for release in 2022. Oh, suddenly Digital Libido was prophetic in less than two years. Because a lot of the things we thought we wrote the book would happen in say 20, 30 years time happened already two years later because of COVID-19. Yeah. So I would say our futurological map has been correct. Uh, the important things we talked about have happened or are about to happen. What people don't realize yet is that all the old institutions will go before this is over. And, and they will fight, try to stay relevant, to stay alive. And they will accuse of all kinds of things when we don't want to say them, right? But like you and I don't do television, we're online and everything we do. I think it pays off to go into the new world, the new technologies, and new ways of communicating as quickly as possible. Because again, the sooner you learn the new technologies, the sooner you learn programming, the sooner you learn to use media and all these things, the better off you are once these things are implemented in the large scale. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully with you. Um, fully with you. Um, when you when and we just talked about the future. Um, Ray Kurzweil obviously came up with the theme of the singularity now has supposed to be happening 2038. Is that something you are on board with? Do you feel it's gonna happen and it's gonna be a massive amount of brain power? And we really have no way to predict what's beyond it, or do you feel it's not gonna gonna look like as fantastic as Ray Kurzweil makes it out to be? Probably not. So <laughs> fantastic for whom? That's the question. Uh, I would say life, um, we, we wrote about this in the synthesis book a lot. It's actually a response to what I think is cursed by very sort of amateur and a bit infantile fantasies to go on with the back. So, um, <laughs> but we, we work with that constantly. So what this is called is called emergences. So an emergence is that something suddenly happens. There's a certain state of complexity where certain things apparently can occur, often just for once and never again. But after an emergence of real importance, you get an emergence vector. I give you a perfect example of this, for example, physics. Now, suddenly at a certain stage, physics became chemistry. But chemistry operates very differently from physics. And the same way, at least on one planet, one time, you know, quite a long time ago, life suddenly occurred and biology came out of chemistry. And we all know this was on planet Earth. So we have biology here now that we deal with biology as its own emergence vector. That's what a singularity is. A singularity is nothing more or less than an emergence. But the question here is really this one. It's very, very unlikely that we will have a point in time where technological development will certainly kick in a whole new gear. And what will then happen cannot be described with any of the vocabularies or any of the narratives we've explored before. You could not explain biology to somebody only knew chemistry. You can't, right? Yeah. <laughs> but once biology exists, then it makes sense to explain and start a fantasize about what could come after biology. No, probably nobody who did biology or was involved in biology. It's kind of weird here to talk about this way because obviously you need mind to talk about biology, but mind is a later emergence and its own emergence spectrum. When people talk about the difference between mind and matter and there's a mind matter problem and all that. Yeah, no, it's only a question of prior to the emergence, you've got pure biology. After the emergence, you've got something called mind that requires biology built on it, that is a different category altogether. And in this sense, we could even speak of technology itself as its own emergence when human beings discovered that they could extend their own bodies, which is tech and technologies, how you extend your own body, make yourself more powerful by creating tools that add strength to your body. That's what technology means. And the technological development that happened with human beings and homo sapiens, and we know some animals also have very rough technologies, but rarely, rarely developed them. We started developing these technologies in, in hunting tribes. And then eventually this kicked in with printing presses and, and before that written language. 
and, and the fact you could you could you could write down everything you invented during your life. So the next generation could build on your knowledge and didn't have to reinvent everything, right? That is essentially what civilization is. And all of this develops. Yeah, it's quite likely we get to a certain point where, oh, wow, things just suddenly changed in a way that this could not have been imagined. Now, for good or bad, when that happens, it's like Quentin Malassou, the French philosopher said, um, he said once, there's only one word for that action, that's the word God. <laughs> Take, you know, he came up with a wonderful one line. He said, God is way too important a concept to leave to the religious. Right? Because we don't have any other word for the unthinkable. Yeah. And that's when the synthesis book we say, instead of saying that God created the world and we live in his creations, that's ridiculous. Creations can have existed forever or creations can come out of creations. That we don't need a God for that. Actually, we should not have one to begin with to think it properly through. But if God is a great word, why don't we take it back and say God is something that could still happen? And I don't think we have another word for it. I think, I think Kurtzfeld's proposal, which is the singularity, I would say, why not just call it God then, or Synthios, the God of creativity or creativity as God. So suddenly there could be a God called Synthios that could occur in history, and that will change everything forever when that happens. Do you feel like God too is kind of like this, what we say if we don't know what it is, because that's kind of you know what, what we've been doing for a long time. We can't explain that it's God. Or do you feel we are headed somewhere? And, and maybe there was an alien creator that, that kind of helped us, you know, gain this consciousness. There's a couple of things that we have as humans that nobody else could even copy by now, right? Like other primates haven't copied consciousness. Do you feel like there no, is someone... Actually, 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 somewhere? If an alien creator would have created this, and somebody would have had to create the alien creator, you end up with turtles all the way down. You can't... No. <laughs> right. but then we have not created anything to begin with. We only mimic everything we ever did. And consciousness is also overrated. I'm, I'm a big fan of theory of mind, but I think consciousness of America is overrated. Most of the things you do in your life are subconscious. And it's only after yeah, and inside. You make up a story about why you did what you, why you did. Or your that's wife true. yells at you and then you say, yeah, I was responsible for that. But somebody has to invent something that is responsible. Right? So subjectivity is actually quite, in our philosophy, quite marginal. We, we're very much focused on the human being, a bodied, embodied person, an embodied creature of some kind. In that sense, we're not different from other animals. But on top of that, we have a mind that sort of go off in all kinds of directions. And we have language in which we can communicate with each other in a way that animals cannot do. And that's essentially what it means to be human. So we're not headed somewhere. Like we are not the bootloader for machines. We're not let's just like providing spare parts for some alien intelligence that needed another ship, so to speak, right? That's kind of- No, 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 no. And I'm not a determinist. I'm neither determinist nor indeterminist. I think both positions are wrong. We know from physics, for example, that determinism and determinism happens locally. We kind of say that the world globally as a whole, the entire universe that we've developed over the last 14 billion years, that that is deterministic. No, it is It's way too complex to understand from determinism or indeterminism. It's not a program because where the hell was that program written in that case? You know, it's just, yeah, no. But once you go into the natural sciences, yeah, no, yeah. no. But once you go into what a wave function collapses, you realize, oh my God, it's no pre program to any of this at all. It's just complexities colliding with other complexities colliding with other complexities. And it's called pan dialecticism, the, the whole way you look at the world. And once you see the world that way, it becomes kind of challenging. Well, if I knew everything that would happen in the world, all that was where I could predict the future. Uh, no, you could not, <laughs> because actually there are moving all of these things, and they are in relations with one another, and they're also exposed to gravity and decoherence, every one of them. So you cannot predict at all where you are heading. Actually, the yeah. future is contingent, and it's only in hindsight that we try to make the world look like necessity. Yeah. So we should give up on science. <laughs> no, not that's at all. Kinda like we were, like, that, that's that's a bit like this, you know. I, I know about quantum mechanics, how complicated it gets, and with the multiverse theories, and nobody can really. We don't have a good 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 way. No, of I don't. I don't believe the multiverse theories are interesting. Even I think they're boring. And I, I know superstring theory is interesting to study. They just about it. everybody comes on board with that one and limits everybody because they have some interesting concepts that I use philosophically speaking. Superstrings aren't very interesting either. What is interesting actually studying space time itself. I was always interested in that question. And that was like a question that phys physicists wanted to avoid because it was so fiendishly difficult. Because like, well, if you don't understand the background on which you base everything else, then you haven't really gone to the bottom of understanding reality. You're lazy, right? 
if you don't understand what space is, and if, certainly if you don't understand what time is, which is philosophically incredibly interesting, then you haven't really done your homework. Because if you think space-time is a given that we cannot understand on which the atoms are dancing, then you're still back at Newton. You haven't done I, I, I fully agree. Where, where, where do you think should I look in order to understand space-time and actually beyond that concept? Because a lot of people I talk to on the podcast, they feel like, well, this is it's light speed, it's general relativity, special relativity, and that's about it. We don't want to assume more because then we, we, the equations don't work. We don't want to talk about that, right? Or we don't want to talk about the early stage of the universe what's before the Big Bang, because we don't have data, we can't measure it. So the, 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 the discussion oh, yeah. immediately... No, 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 I believe in the Big Bounce, firmly so. Baudrillard showed the equation 2011. You remove the infinities and the zeros from the mathematics, and infinity and zeros do not exist in physical reality, then you can actually understand that there was a Big Bounce. Now, what the big, how the Big Bounce operated, Baudrillard's theories, Penrose's interesting theories about that. You can do a lot of work that way. No, I think we should just be deeper. Go deeper yeah. in science, and I think Lee Smallin has done fantastic work. He did. He he, he partnered up with one of my colleagues, Roberto Mangabera Unger, who is a great Brazilian philosopher, and, and they written a couple of really great books. and And, and they're very very concerned with claim that the question of time is being massively more because time has not been understood at all. Yeah. And uh, my my proposal is that time are actually two different things. It's just like Bergson said, time and duration aren't necessarily the same things, and. That's because time arrives in discrete units from one moment to the next, where duration is a continuity. And this could also explain why you never can reunite quantum physics as we know it with, with a relativity theory, because one of them is actually built on continuities in mathematics, and the other one is built on discretions. And once you operate with discretion, it's like, it's like trying to, you know, type the, the title, uh, the, the number of phi, right? So, you know, it's three plus 14, and then it starts forever and never ends, right? Because the circle is perfectly continuous, whereas the discrete mathematics of, of, of its cardinal numbers is not. So you cannot unite these two. You have to live with the ambivalence between the two. And actually, that's how our world fundamentally operates. Hegel had done physics. He would have been obsessed with the difference between this question and continuity. It's a deep, deep philosophical question, and it now eats into the very fabrics of our reality. Are we going to talk about? It? When you think about the next couple of years, and you, 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 I mean, you just explained the world and the universe. What are the questions you really want to solve? Is there something where, where, where your fingers are burning? That's something you really want to write a book about the next couple of years. <laughs> oh, there's so many things, and, and some things get stuck, and you don't get any further, uh, and some things just explode in your face, and then somebody comes up with surprising new ideas of work. What? What was that? That's interesting. Oh, it even relates to my philosophical world. I must study that. You know, it's something I might have to work with. You know, it depends on. There are surprises all the time. Don't say there are surprises all the time. But what I work towards, though, getting older, uh, is a better understanding of what it means to be human. And, and that's like a fixed entity. And that's why I say to people, no, it's not even psychology people should study. They should study archetypology. Study what different types of humans are there. And spend time doing that. If you do anthropology and then you go into archetypology, you understand humans. You've actually not wasted a single minute of your time because humans will always be humans. Or humans will be humans at least for a very, very, very long time to come. Even if we synthetically, biologically started altering ourselves and get rid of diseases before we get them and things like that, that's on a par with the medical revolutions we had 200 years ago, but they won't alter our minds. And they won't alter what it means to be human. And the human body is a clean district. Yeah. We have not even begun to touch the surface of understanding what it means. But we can see through our behaviors and our psychological constructs of the world, we can see what it means to be human. And that's better time spent than technology. Because if you want to focus on technology, you have to relearn everything every three to four years. Yeah, a lot of people think that when going through technology now, they, they, it goes through a similar phase. We kind of, we kind of jokingly say opening eyes like a teenager, right? It has the same intelligence, not that it has a real intelligence, right? But we are re, re, recreating children in form of technology. So we go through what being human actually means, get through the same models, and eventually get to where adults are or where someone really lies like you is. Um, and that's what technology, once it has, there's one machine you can spread it out um, all over. Um, universe, so to speak, right? All machines can learn it instantly. So that's this big bang that people feel in the next 20 years. Once we decoded humanity, we can make the better human, the forever living human that goes through the universe. I, I feel yeah, like I mean, hey, that's what quantum, right? the most interesting thing with quantum computers is, is the possibility for them to do AI on a par with synthetic biology because it requires so much number crunching. 
And, and of course, the other thing I want AI to do is to finally design the fusion nuclear reactor that actually works, right? So, <laughs> yes. Because we can only gamble when we have human designers designing those things, right? But yeah. with AI, we could probably design it perfectly from day one, build it once, and then it comes. Yeah. AI will shortcut all the implementation phases of anything you want to develop. It's enormous. I mean, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I would say also we could, we could think of, well, there's a limited, intelligence is the right word. When we speak of will to power, as a deeply human force, right? Machines cannot experience will to power at all because the power itself is only electricity when you put it into a machine. It only pushes things forward as electricity does. Uh, it, can, it can therefore at best be interested in intelligence gathering and processing because that happens to be discrete operation. But it cannot be interested in what we call pathos. Your feelings, your emotions, how you react to things, how how your but senses you react emotions, to other right? things. Any I will have emotions. Then you have emotions. Short yeah. And I say that's why machines cannot crack jokes and their songs they write sound terribly eerie and weird. Like it sounds like somebody's trying to copy something that works and really figure but, out. But I think they will. They will. They will. No. No. Isn't it I, I, think, I think I think machines can create culture for people with really bad taste. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you well, that's a sophisticated requirement for yeah. your taste, like you want to be surprised or transformed by culture, it cannot happen with machines that we know them today because they are stuck with the distraction. It, it's stuck with the series of ones. Even if they operate series of ones at almost the infinite speed, doesn't matter. It's still just series of ones you do when you do technology. So, yes, I expect the machines to conquer outer space for us because we're not fit to go there. So let's leave outer space to machines that then kidnap some bacteria and take with them and model as they so wish, and therefore they can create life forms on other planets and things. So the sort of dull, gray, cold universe we're looking at could change into something way more exciting. That could be interesting. So we then as humans could go and visit for a week or so in, in Mars or something and before we want to get back to Earth again, which is our hope, right? But as far as the human body is concerned, and as far as we can take biology, biological development, we as human beings will be stuck on this planet for hundreds or possibly thousands of years. It's only hubris to think otherwise. But the fact that you and I don't care whether a third guy goes to Mars or whether the machine that we happen to like goes to Mars, that will happen yeah. within a generation. And then we'll be happy to send a machine that's much more adaptable to live on Mars. So being human necessarily in your mind means we have to have a human body and the limitations of the human body and we be with other humans. It cannot be something that a machine can ever, I don't know, I don't want to say emulate, but I think they have to have, it's a survival strategy and they will sooner or later copy that survival strategy. So they will behave like that. You need emotions. But then, then, then the machine must be a neurological functioning machine, not anything yeah. we know today. And then it must have yeah. bloodstreams and things. And then it's no longer a machine, is it? then you're basically yeah. building Frankenstein's monster, something you're building a human. So the description of the human that you just described, we're far from that. We, 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 we have very fast, very fast computing is what we do. Yeah. And what that can do is what we do. Yeah. Alexander, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, to that answer in your next book. I uh, really thank you for your time. I mean, you've been very generous with this. Um, that was awesome, that was incredible. Thanks for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I've been here with, for totally selfish reasons having this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Alexander, that was awesome. Thanks so much again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take it easy. Bye for now. Talk soon. Yes. Bye, Alexander. Yes. Bye.